Leading an institution when times are good is easy. When they're tough, then you've got to find it within yourself to be strong, to live values, and provide the guidance and leadership that people need to move forward. Welcome to the Northern Sentinels podcast. On this episode, I sit down with our former chief of the defense staff, former head of the Canadian Space Agency, and former Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs, Walt Natinchek. A child of Polish and German immigrants, Walt grew up in Winnipeg and has a truly remarkable family history. After completing his degree at Collège Militaire Royal in Saint-Jean, Quebec, he spent 37 years in the military, eventually being appointed to the top job at the height of Canada's involvement in the Afghan War. After taking off the uniform, he led the Canadian Space Agency and then became the top public servant at Veterans Affairs, where he continued to support those who protect us. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone with more passion and energy for service, Canada, and Canadians. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Walt Natinchek. Walt, thanks for taking the time to come by the house and, uh, and be part of the Northern Sentinels podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Chris. And thanks for doing this in your interest. Um, I look forward to the next uh, a few minutes of discussion. Now, we uh, through my reading and through previous discussions, you were a, you're a child of, uh, of immigrants from Poland and from, from Germany. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of your, your family history sure. uh, before coming to Canada? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Chris. Yeah, my uh, my mom and dad uh, came to Canada after uh, World War II, and it's it's interesting because it was only in later years that um, I realized um, the kind of journey that each one of them took. Um, my father passed away when I was quite young, when I was uh, nine years old, um, and uh, he had uh, been born and raised in eastern Poland, an area that's now Belarus, and uh, he and his family were moved by the Soviets um, in 1940 uh, to Siberia to a, a gulag, uh, that um, which is basically a work camp, and um, and he survived 18 months of that, and uh, he and the older brothers uh, were able to uh, make the walk. Uh, the long walk uh, and move to um, to join the Polish uh, f- uh, Free Army um, in the Middle East, uh, and unfortunately, my grandparents and um, five of his siblings either passed away on the trip to the Siberia uh, in the camp, or were given to the Red Cross, and the family lost track of them. My mother, on the other hand, was German. Her family came, it came from the area around uh, uh, where Ramstein Air Base is, actually just south of okay, it, okay. and uh, south of Launchstuhl Hospital area. And, uh, and uh, she was going to be a nurse's aide in Germany, got drafted into the German Air Force, into the Luftwaffe, to be an aerial searchlight operator. And uh, and so as a young teenager, she and a bunch of other young ladies would operate these aerial searchlights looking for bombers. And uh, and then after the war, she emigrated to Canada as uh, as an economic refugee in the early 50s. So um, going back to my dad, he then joined the, the Polish army, uh, became a Sherman tank driver uh, in General Anders's uh, uh, army, the Polish uh, army, uh, fought through North Africa, Sicily, up the boot of Italy, and uh, and wounded at uh, Monte Cassino. Um, and uh, his tank got hit, and he convalesced in the in the UK, and uh, arrived at Pier Twenty One in uh, in May of forty seven. As an indentured worker, he had to spend two years working on a farm. Um, in uh, in western Manitoba, uh, that cold area that I know so well, <laughs> and uh, but he had two years of working out there, 
And uh, after two years of working on the farm, he joined a construction company in Winnipeg because he could drive a Sherman tank. He could drive a front end loader tractor. And so uh, he worked for a construction company and uh, met my mom at a church dance uh, in Winnipeg. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to see how this country, Canada, has welcomed uh, immigrants after a terrible time of the war and, uh, and uh, you know, raising a family. Uh, we were three kids, my older sister Evelyn, younger sister Susan. Um, it's funny, my, my dad's English was terrible. He would you know, mo- mostly try to speak Polish and broken English, and my mother's English was bad as well, and she would speak <laughs> broken English and a lot of German. And when they got upset, each one of them got pretty excited in their own native tongues. And so learning English for us was kind of tough. Uh, my father used to say, uh, what I do remember of what he said is, had he known he was going to marry a German, he probably would have shot himself. And he said that in jest, obviously. But uh, but during the war, you know, he uh, he he fought uh, valiantly. Um, anyway, so just to say, it was a it was a kind of unique uh, situation, and and for me, I've always been grateful to the country um, for giving my parents a home. I mean, it's I think it's a really fascinating family background because it shows that welcoming both sides after a conflict, uh, which I think is, is really neat. And the other thing we were talking about beforehand uh, and this sort of connection with uh, with where your, your father was north of Dauphin and that my, my wife's father's family did, just did the same sort of thing. It was immigrated to that part of Manitoba yeah. as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the connections are, are not that far apart between uh, between a lot of us. And, and a significant portion of it seems to be with you know, where our families came from and the, and those shared experiences, which I think really powerful. Absolutely, shared adversity, and uh, if they could uh, if they could survive in in really rugged uh, conditions in Europe, then they could survive in the Manitoba prairies in those cold cold winters. My my dad was a blacksmith, you know, and uh, uh, when the when the Soviets came and took him away, he was nineteen years old and the oldest of ten kids. But he was a blacksmith, and so he could apply those skills uh, in uh, in uh, north of Dauphin. Yeah, and you because you talked at the start about your your family uh, being in a in a gulag in Siberia. What was the impetus for that? How did that end up happening? Because you just said your father was taken away by the Soviets. What occurred was uh, with the beginning of the war in thirty nine, um, the Russians moved into what was Eastern Poland. And uh, the area that is now Belarus. So my my father's uh, sorry my grandfather's farm was just outside the town of Pinsk, and um, and in February February tenth nineteen forty, the Soviets came to the house and said to the to grandfather, okay, you have a choice. You can either remain here, become Russian, uh, or you're going to be relocated. Grandfather understood, and I heard this from my uncle, uh, one of the last surviving uncles who lived in the UK. Grandfather thought relocation meant moving somewhere else in Poland. Right. But the next day, the family was rounded up, um, herded to the train station, put on a cattle car. Uh, My father didn't have to go because he was working in Pinsk as a blacksmith. He came home to join the family for whatever is going to happen. And and again, from this uncle, my uncle Peter, uh, indicated that they were on the cattle car for 13 days without food. Um, in fact, at one point at a coaling station in the middle of a barren region, nothing out there at all, the, they just stopped for coal and water for the locomotive. The doors opened up, and uh, my uncle Peter got off the train looking for food, tried to forage for food. Like there was nothing there. By the time he got back to the tracks, the train was gone. Six months later, he's in a food lineup at a camp in uh, Siberia. The place is called Tashkent. He's in a food lineup and one of his brothers taps him on the shoulder and says, Peter, where have you been? Unbelievable. And, and at that point, grandfather had died on the car. In the on the train, as had 
two infant twins. Um, and grandmother died of tuberculosis in the camp. And so my father tried to keep the family together in moving forward. Mm. So anyway, it was just a very difficult time. And yet, out of all that adversity, uh, my dad and four brothers survived and stayed connected uh, after the war. And so he came to he came to Canada, and then but you said he didn't stay north of Dauphin. He moved down to Winnipeg after two years. So they had to they had indentured service for two years, and then went down to uh, to Winnipeg to work in construction. And that's where you were born. And I was born in Winnipeg. And born in I guess born and raised until you born and raised in Winnipeg until I joined the the Canadian Armed Forces in 1975. So what was life like as a kid in in Winnipeg? I, it was fabulous. I mean, we were the baby boomers, eh? So there were kids all over the place, but we had huge freedom, huge flexibility. And, and you know what? And I think about going back to my first leadership opportunities. In grade six, I was the lieutenant of the school patrol, the safety patrol. <laughs> you know, so uh, another uh, young lady uh, was the captain and I was the lieutenant. And, uh, and I thought this was pretty cool. I'd been in, in scouts and, uh, I really liked airplanes. And so I joined air cadets. Um, but through high school, I was, uh, an NCO in cadets. Uh, I was playing football for my high school, Daniel McIntyre Collegiate Institute. And I was flipping burgers, uh, in this restaurant. I'd rolled in at the urging of my mom because I delivered papers since I was 10 years old for for the Winnipeg Free Press. And uh, at 15, my mom told me, hey, you're too big to be delivering papers. You, you need to get a real job. So my sister had been working at this restaurant and I kind of rolled in and they said, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 16. And I wasn't. Anyway, I started flipping burgers. And, uh, and then air cadets wanted to send me on the senior leadership course in Coal Lake, Alberta. So I went to my manager and I said, hey, listen, I, I think I'm going to have to quit and uh, go on this air cadet course. And he says, what course? And I told him, senior leadership course. And he said, you know what? I did that course. If you do that course and come back, I'll make you an assistant manager. So at the age of 16, I became an assistant manager at the Camps Burger Joint on the corner of McPhillips and Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> while I was playing football and while I was, you know, a, a warrant officer, master warrant officer in the air cadet. So it was like, it was madness. But so my upbringing, I was so lucky, you know, even though my mom had a tough time after my dad's death in, in 1967, you know, um, she was widowed um, prior to many of the, of the widow benefits. And so we were like really poor. We were on social assistance. We were on welfare for a while until... My younger sister was old enough to go into to school and uh, my mom could go back to her job. So there was very little support. So we were on, on welfare for a while. So, But we never thought ourselves poor because my mom did such a, an amazing job of keeping us together and putting food on the table and mending our, our clothes and the hand-me-downs and that kind of thing. So I thought I had a really good upbringing. And... At what point did you start to think about uh, what you were going to do after high school? I tell you, when uh, when I got into cadets and uh, I did uh, one of the summer camps, they, they were in Penhold, Alberta, and I realized I was I was good at it, uh, and, and I enjoyed and I enjoyed the camaraderie. Um, I thought mm, this is pretty good, and and I really liked. Um, the notion of flying. I really wanted to be a, a pilot and get into that. I didn't realize uh, until I did the medical uh, clearance to be a pilot in air cadets that I have uh, a color blindness issue, contrast color blindness. Okay. So uh, of the 20 test plates, uh, I got about eight wrong. <laughs> so so it was like, hmm. just as an aside, I've bought my wife a lot of purple uh, outfits in the last 40 years of our marriage. So I've learned not to buy anything because I, what I think is a beautiful royal blue turned out to be purple. No, not royal blue. <laughs> so, so anyway, I couldn't be a pilot. And, um, and so uh, 
Uh, but I, I thought, you know, if, um, again, we, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, I didn't want to put a burden on my mom and family to go to university. Um, and, and again, nobody in the entire family had ever gone to university before. Uh, I was the first one ever to go to, go to university. Um, but I didn't want a burden on the family. And uh, so I thought, mm, maybe I'll try this regular officer training plan and, uh, and see how it goes. And so it was really... Uh, you know, this convergence of enjoying cadets, enjoying leadership. And again, I learned a lot of leadership out of football, a lot of leadership out of uh, sports. I learned a lot of leadership out of being an assistant manager <laughs> at a restaurant. And, uh, and certainly it came together with the notion of a good education. Um, and so at the uh, right age of 17, uh, I left Winnipeg and, uh, uh, went off to Roy Rhodes Military College in Victoria to start my military career. Did you feel any, any sense of responsibility to stay in Winnipeg? I mean, so it's your mom. Yeah. How many siblings do you have? Two. So I had okay. at the time my older and younger sister. I, I really did hope to get accepted for civilian university um, uh, with the regular officer training plan with the Canadian Armed Forces. I was really hoping to stay with uh, the University of Manitoba mm. and be close at home and support my mom. Uh, but after the uh, the uh, offer came in, uh, you know, I consulted with her. She was not happy in the first instance that I had opted to join the military. Again, her career choice for me was to become a priest. Uh, she was very religious, especially after my father passed away. Uh, religion gave her the strength to endure and to uh, raise us as a family. And uh, she thought if, if I didn't want to be a priest, then I should be a, a carpenter. If it was good enough for Joseph, then it should be good enough for me. Uh, anyway, but after all the considerations and a good discussion, she supported my choice uh, to go to the military and to go to Royal Roads. And what was that transition like? So leaving home and then joining the military and being on the, on the West Coast at a small military college? Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it wasn't that difficult because the year before I had done the six-week senior leader, leadership course at Coal Lake, Alberta. Right. And what's interesting for me, upon reflection, is that the curriculum or the the training program for the Air Cadet Senior Leadership Course in 1974 in Coal Lake mirrored basic officer training program mm. mirrored uh, and um, one of the senior um, uh, instructors who put us through our paces in cold lake in the summer of 1974 turned out to be my senior cadet uh, at royal roads military college in victoria in 1975 don olioski uh, you know, he, here he'd been barking at us on parade in 74. I arrive in Victoria and it's the same voice. <laughs> barking <laughs> me again. And it's like that small world, you know, and, and, uh, some of the folks I had, uh, I had met at, uh, air cadet camp, uh, uh, some of their siblings were uh, at Royal road. So, so I had those connections right off. So everything I'd done before, actually put me at ease getting into the military college. My difficulty, unfortunately, was academic. It wasn't, it was not uh, from a leadership standpoint. It wasn't from, um, you know, uh, an, an athletic standpoint. It was academics. And so at the time I came out of Manitoba, we didn't take any calculus at all. And going into military college, and at the time when I found out that I wasn't, um, uh, eligible to be uh, in the Air Force as a pilot, they put me into land ordnance engineering. At the time, it was called LORI. Now it's electrical mechanical engineering, uh, or REMI now. Uh, but at the time, I was going to be a mechanical engineer, and and calculus and and you know mathematics as well as uh, physics and chemistry kind of important. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, unfortunately, I was missing one of the key. Uh, uh, factors there. I was missing the whole calculus program. And so, and then the other challenge is as soon as I got to Royal Roads, 
uh, they didn't have a football program, but they have a rugby program. And they realized I was a football player coming out of Manitoba. I got drafted on the rugby team. And here we are in a very intense recruit period where you really don't have a moment to yourself and you're using every bit of energy you have in order to maintain the standards, um, you know, do all the physical activity. I was also on the varsity rugby team. And then they realized that because of my size, I should also be on the varsity tug of war team. <laughs> So here I was a recruit and a first year kid, or subsequently a first year cadet on both the varsity um, rugby team and the varsity tug of war team. So five days a week on the varsity team and weekends. Uh, and I don't have calculus academically at Christmas. I bombed. <laughs> I bombed. It was my first academic failure ever. And it was like, hmm, <laughs> this isn't going well. But athletically, it was going well. And leadership-wise, yeah. it was going well. <laughs> so so how did you manage the, that failure then? Because it's, I mean, that's an interesting point in your life to hit your first academic failure, is in, yeah. you know, especially the university program yeah. like military college. Yeah. And especially my, uh, my um, uh, academic advisor was the principal. Of, oh, um, really? Of, well, <laughs> Dr. Graham was my was my academic advisor, and here I am bombing across the board. Uh, one of my rugby coaches is my squadron commander, Dennis O'Brien. God bless him, and he kept encouraging me on, you know, keep going, keep going. But I knew that I had this massive gap of knowledge uh, in these three core subjects: um, in calculus, in uh, physics, and in chemistry. So not only did I fail all three exams at the Christmas exams. I failed all three supplementary exams. And so I should have been out the door right. uh, and released. Um, this is where I learned a lot about compassion and and, uh, and understanding of, of people's circumstances due to, I believe, the leadership of Dr. Graham from an academic standpoint and uh, the squadron commander, uh, Captain Dennis O'Brien. Uh, they kept me on. Uh, for about six weeks as they work with National Defense Headquarters and the personnel folks to figure out what to do with me. And at the time, I was strongly contemplating just joining the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and starting, okay. starting a second career, absolutely. Uh, but the, the guidance I got from my squadron commander, Dennis O'Brien, he said, you know, uh, just for the time being, spend your time at the library and keep studying whatever you want to study uh, and keep playing rugby. <laughs> more, he played rugby. More importantly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Royal Rose is very rugby focused. At one point, when I blew my knee out playing rugby on AstroTurf at the U.S. Uh, Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, uh, after I came out of hospital with my knee, I received this medical uh, chit, this med medical instruction from the doc, which said, no drill, no running, uh, no PT, rugby only. <laughs> <laughs> I should have kept that shit, but I, I would show that shit. Anyway, I think my rugby coach had a chat with the doc. Anyway, um, after six weeks, uh, National Defense Headquarters gave me the option of going from uh, engineering into uh, arts uh, and from a classification standpoint, going from land ordnance engineering to any one of the combat arms. And so when my squadron commander asked me about this, I said, you know, my dad was a tanker. If the armor corps is good enough for my dad, it's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. And that was that was really the rationale for the choice. So joined the armor corps and, and it went OK. And how, how did your military college career wrap up then? Uh, so after two years at Rhodes, um, uh, I was really enticed by uh, the football program and the uh, the uh, degree program for administration, business administration at Collège Militaire Royal de Saint Jean. So, uh, in 1977, myself and um, seven other, I believe the number was, uh, cadets from Rhodes went to CMR. It was a large number of, in relative terms, of uh, folks went to Collège Militaire Royal de Saint Jean. And uh, I was thrilled, uh, it, but it was amazing when I arrived there right after finishing the summer training in Gagetown, armor training, I arrived in my little Volkswagen Beetle uh, at CMR 
and you know they guided me to my room and I arrive in my room and there's a there's a, a sign on my door saying, you're late for football practice. <laughs> football practice started this time. You should be here. I was like, I had no clue. And so I just dumped all my stuff. I went over. I didn't know where the gym was or the football field was, but I went over to the change rooms and kind of walk in. And there is a locker with my name and all of my football equipment. And so I hadn't even, you know, found anything, but anything on the college except my football locker, I got into uniform and I went out into the field. <laughs> I had not played football, you know, since I left high school. I was going to ask you the last time you played. And, and here I am playing, going both ways, playing uh, a defensive end and middle linebacker. <laughs> yeah. And so I was so fortunate with uh, the extraordinary coaching of Major Bob Swan, who was the coach and an extraordinary group of, of young athlete football players. And we won the uh, Quebec Junior College Championship, the Bull Door. Uh, but besides that, I learned uh, beaucoup, uh, beaucoup de Francais, BOC. I learned a lot of French and I learned a lot of um, uh, the nature of culture in Quebec that I really uh, appreciated. And so I graduated out of uh, Collège Métal Royal de Saint-Jean, having had uh, just a fabulous time um, in Saint-Jean, and, um, and by that point, I had done all my summer training in Gagetown to be an armor officer, and um, offered the opportunity to serve in, in the Royal Canadian Dragoons, my regiment in Germany. So, uh, you know, at the age of uh, 21, um, you know, packed my four bags and four boxes and, and went to Germany. And... Uh, this was um, uh, August of 1979. And, and again, it was interesting. I arrived in Germany and uh, the assistant adjutant of the Royal Canadian Drag Dragoons kind of picked this up and kind of the same mentality of you're late. Uh, the exercise has already <laughs> started. And so we're going to get take you to the mess, give you uh, a couple beverages and then pack you up tonight. And we're taking you to the field. And and I show up uh, somewhere north of Stuttgart, Germany to meet my uh, troop of, uh, of, uh, uh, of soldiers uh, and these four brand new leopard uh, tanks. They were still on warranty in that, at that time. Okay. And, uh, and began almost like a three month exercise reforger. We came home in October. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but that was my introduction to, uh, to the Armor Corps and it was fabulous. What was your first impression of, uh, of the Canadian Army? Uh, in 1979, it was a fascinating time uh, because we had in the army, the folks who were just retiring in the later 70s were those who had experience in World War II and Korea. Uh, and uh, going into the Royal Canadian Dragoons with brand new equipment was extraordinary and especially as we were able to compare ourselves with some of the allied armies out there, we thought we were pretty good. I was surprised by the amount of alcohol at the time. And I've, in hindsight, I've tried to reflect on, like, why was it that way? And was it the norms of the 40s and the 50s reflected here in the 70s and the 80s? But over my time... Uh, those veterans of Korea and World War II retired and things got tightened up. But when I arrived in Germany, my first night, that, that first night with my troops, uh, it was a, a squadron party. And I've never seen such a, an, an extraordinary case of, of alcoholism and, and poor behavior. Uh, and I'm just pleased to see that, that it changed dramatically uh, thereafter. In terms of early mentors, I mean, what did you take away from uh, your time, whether it be in Germany or in your early years as a commissioned officer that mm -hmm. helped you in, later in your career? You know, I think we all see leaders who are, some leaders who are really quite strong and some leaders who have uh, difficulties and shortcomings. And you learn from both of them, both types of leaders. Um, those leaders who are, who have shortcomings 
you realize those are some of the attributes, some of the ways to lead that you want to avoid at all costs. Uh, you see other leaders who use skills, techniques to inspire, uh, to create hope, to provide clear guidance and direction. And you just want to embrace all of those. Uh, I was lucky um, early on. Uh, I saw some of those leaders who would inspire. Um, uh, you know, I give credit to Major General Retired Clive Milner, hmm. who inspired me to become a much more soldier focused leader who speaks from the heart, speak truth um, in plain language so everyone understands, uh, and to be a less formal leader. You know, leaders who tend to write down every written word that they're about to give um, sometimes um, lose the attention, <laughs> lose, lose, lose the, uh, uh, their, their audience. But Clive Milner uh, and Clive Addy, another uh, great general officer, uh, inspired me to be the kind of leader I am. Um, and uh, there were other leaders who... Uh, who, uh, in my view, had some shortcomings, and I realized some of the some of the things I never wanted to do, I never wanted to inflict on others. And if I saw those attributes in other leaders, I would ensure that they were either counseled or took another path. Mm. How? At what point did um, did you meet your wife and and sort of start to build the family unit that then would yeah. support and accompany you? you know, throughout your career. Yeah, I was very lucky. My wife, Leslie, uh, arrived in Germany in the summer of 1980. She was an Ottawa Carleton uh, school teacher, and she'd been contracted with other uh, school teachers to um, teach the Canadian dependent children uh, in large Germany. And uh, we, we met uh, at the officer's mess um, in, uh, in Germany. She had just had uh, or just attended an, an open house uh, by my regiment, the Royal Canadian Dragoons, and uh, and uh, and then we had a bit of a discussion uh, after that, and uh, and so we we uh, met or dated for a while after that, played squash together uh, for a while, but uh, two years later I proposed, uh, and uh, we got married in Germany. So I went to Germany with. Um, four boxes and a football. I left Germany four years later with a wife, uh, a little baby girl. Uh, my daughter, Margaret, was born in Lahr in 83 uh, and 88 boxes. <laughs> so, so that's quite a contrast that's, in four years. That's a good effort. Uh, did Leslie have any exposure to the military? I mean, what was the, the, the driver for her to to come over to Germany to sort of immerse into this Canadian community. Uh, so Leslie is an exceptional teacher. Um, and I know that from talking to her students and her and her, and the parents of students. Uh, and unfortunately, over our, our years together, and we were now at 41 years of marriage, but I pulled her out of tenure three times. Um, and, uh, and so Leslie's parents were both serving in the Canadian military. Okay. Uh, Leslie's uh, dad was a machinist uh, in the engineers, uh, and um, and her mom uh, was uh, a sergeant uh, in the Quacks, and uh, had been at the depot in um, in south- southwestern Ontario, and so uh, and Alberta roots, uh, but uh, Leslie's older sister Anne had had uh, an experience. Uh, teaching in Baden-Baden uh, or Baden-Solingen, uh, which was the other Canadian base in Germany. And so Leslie had gone across and visited her sister, uh, really liked the opportunity to teach and, and to see Europe. And uh, and so she arrived in 1980, and I was blessed <laughs> by, by that. So, yeah, and, uh, and here we are 41 years later. <laughs> So when you came back from Germany, uh, well, where did you land and what did the sort of the next part of your career, maybe your tactical career look like leading up to regimental command? I'll just say that after Germany, uh, I knew um, I was tired. 
Uh, again, it was four years of, of regimental time, and I was also at brigade headquarters as the uh, uh, aide de camp for the brigade commander. At the time, it was Brigadier General John de Chasselin. And so after four years, and especially uh, in, uh, in spring of uh, 83, our daughter was born uh, in Germany, 1st of March. And, uh, and she, was, she was born, and within a week, I was going off on a, on a month-long exercise. And again, there was no maternity, paternity leave. Uh, my wife was extraordinary. Um, I arrived back in Canada uh, really tired, and I was so blessed to go to Royal Military College uh, as staff. Um, at the time, I had hoped to go to Gagetown as uh, to the armor school as an instructor, and instead went to Royal Military College, and it turned out to be the best thing for us. So we had um, three years of not only fulfilling time, but the opportunity to see extraordinary leaders coming out of the, the Royal Military College system. And again, at the time, I had been a graduate, uh, sorry, I had attended both Royal Roads and CMR, Collège Militaire Royal de Saint-Jean. And so coming to RMC, seeing all three military colleges, I, I think I had a pretty broad view and, and so really enjoyed uh, the years. And it was so good for us as a young family. Uh, and uh, but I did do my my jump course, my parachute course while I was there, because in 1986, I changed cap badges. I became an eighth Canadian Hussar, got sent to Petawawa to be the battle captain of the reconnaissance squadron of the eighth Canadian Hussars and uh, just had a, a fabulous uh, year uh, as a Hussar. And a real highlight was spending um uh, I guess it must have been more than a month, about six weeks in total involved in an Arctic exercise in Iqaluit, where at the time, in February of 87, we took 300 soldiers and armored uh, vehicles, including the Cougar and the APC and a lot of trucks, up to Iqaluit uh, for an exercise called Lightning Strike uh, 1987. And at one point, the temperature with wind chill was minus 104. <laughs> okay. It was so cold that the windshield on, windshield on aircraft were cracking. So, we, in fact, we had no food. Rations aircraft could not come in because it was so cold. And so we're down at Caribou Stew and, and Arctic Char, which was terrific. <laughs> but, but every day, and, and when you have 300 hungry soldiers living in a in this small, relatively small community of Iqaluit, we eat the town out of food pretty quickly. <laughs> anyway, it was a fabulous exercise. And uh, but in '87, I became a a dragoon, uh, rebadged re re again to dragoon, and uh, and I was able to spend five years in Petawawa, including uh, uh, a tour to Cyprus there. But five years in the regiment was great, just, uh, or in Petawawa as a hussar and then a dragoon, seeing the different styles of command leadership, uh, but being in the regiment five years, so with the soldiers, with the non-commissioned members, being able to understand where we've been and where we're going. Um, uh, and it was a really exciting time. And I think that period really uh, affected my leadership style again, seeing the kinds of leaders I did over that period of time. Um, I left uh, Petawawa when, and, and, and thinking back when I was in Germany, I told my wife, you know, marry me and I'll show you the world. <laughs> well, we spent 10 years in Petawawa. <laughs> That's part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. But no, from there we went to Toronto for the staff college and got posted to Montreal while in Montreal, uh, two years at, on the Army staff at the time, the uh, Land Forces Command headquarters was at Saint Hubert, uh, Quebec. So I was on the Army staff, uh, looking at how to improve uh, the reserve force and its operational effectiveness. And then, uh, with the period of financial reductions, how to close bases. I was on the Base Buster team. Okay. And we and it was a really awful tough time seeing how decisions were made when, when arbitrarily we're being cut um, in terms of budget and, and bases were being closed. Uh, and then in the midst of all that, uh, on two weeks' notice, uh, I was told, good news is I, I was promoted to lieutenant colonel. Bad news is I'm going to Bosnia in two weeks for a year. And so <laughs> it was quite a shock to the family, but uh, Leslie, again, was just amazing uh, not only did she support me through this, 
uh, and, and allow me to go off to Bosnia. But the uh, King Forces told me, and oh, by the way, when you come back from uh, Bosnia, you're going to be posted to Ottawa. So your family needs to figure out how to get to Ottawa while you're away. So Leslie packed up with the help of my boss, who is a great guy named Pat McDonough, hmm. uh, a Patricia Lieutenant Colonel, just an amazing leader uh, who I learned a lot from, um, packed up and she moved the family with three kids, uh, dog, iguana, uh, <laughs> And moved to dog and an iguana, or the dog's name dog was iguana. And an iguana, and the dog <laughs> used to chase the iguana. And uh, yeah, uh, an iguana named Scrambo. Uh, anyway, she moved the family to Ottawa, and I came back to be on the vice chief's uh, staff. So it was just an amazing time being in Bosnia in ninety four ninety five. Uh, where I parachuted into an operational headquarters right on the confrontation line between the Croatians and the and the Bosniaks, the Bosnian Croats and the Bosniaks. For six months, I was the chief of operations for uh, Sector Southwest, which was a, a six battalion, 8,000 soldier brigade. And then after six months, moved to Zagreb, where I became the J3, uh, J3 land op. So basically the senior operations person for uh, land operations throughout all of the former Yugoslavia. And, uh, and so it was, you know, a baptism by fire. Hmm. Just yeah. an extraordinary time. You, I mean, I can say this because I, I, I served in the military when, uh, when you were one of the senior leaders, when you were the chief of the defense staff. And you were certainly well known for someone with lots of energy and passion for, for soldiers uh, for soldiering, uh, and then for you know all members of the, the forces, was there ever a point in that transition from being a, a tactical leader when you started to become an institutional leader, uh, where you thought, "Do I really want to do this? I, I love I love this thing here that I started with." Or did you just do the one job after the next and found the the opportunities in each one? How did you approach that? I think it was the latter because I didn't really have a lot of time to think. I <laughs> yeah. mean, seriously, I didn't have a lot of time to think because the pace was so fast. Uh, an example is when we moved into Saint Hubert, uh, when I joined Army headquarters, uh, we had just come out of Toronto, went to found a lovely house to rent in Saint Bruno de Montalville, and we're just unloading the pa- uh, the boxes, and my boss. Uh, a fellow named Cam Ross, uh, retired as Major General Cam Ross, he called me up on day two. Like, we're just un- unpacking the boxes. And he said, Walt, how's the move going? I said, well, the move's going great. Yeah. He says, super. Like, what are you doing later today? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, unfortunately, Walt, I- I've just been told that I'm going to Namibia on a uh, peacekeeping mission, like, immediately. And so, although you haven't arrived yet, you are the corporate knowledge for this job that you're going into. And so, later today, you need to be in Edmonton. Okay. And so, that kind of thing has happened constantly. Like, I got into, arrived in Bosnia, in Gorni Vakuf, on the confrontation line between two warring factions. And while meeting staff... We had a mind blow up within a kilometer, killing both British and Bosnian Croatian soldiers. And I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I'm the, I'm the chief of operations of this outfit. And I still remember a British engineer commanding officer, very Scottish. His name was Robbie Burns. He came up to me and said, hey, Walt, I don't, I, like we've just met. But you're actually in charge of what's going to happen. <laughs> right. And he said, and this lesson has stayed with me for my whole career. He said, you know, nothing you do in the next few minutes are going to bring those soldiers back to life. But if you can just calm this headquarters down and provide clear direction, uh, we might be able to prevent more injuries and, and move forward. Like that happened like right after the explosion. We're just trying to figure things out. And I've always abided by those, you know, sage words back then. You know, a few years later, (laughs) a few years later, here I show up in Ottawa, having just left Bosnia in 
in 99, my first day at work is the 23rd of March, 1999. And I'm the chief of operations of the Canadian Armed Forces. J3 plans and operations of the forces. And my predecessor, Captain um, uh, Stu Andrews, says, hey, Walt, like, you've just come home from Bosnia, which is like the main mission, and all the other missions are pretty straightforward. So handover should be easy. Here are the keys to the office. Have a great day. Super. At the end of the day, after trying to get through the in basket and so on, I turn on this TV with this news television station, CTV Newsnet, and I see the Secretary of State for the U.S., Madeleine Albright, saying we're going to drop bombs in Kosovo. Like right then. Yeah. <laughs> and I realized, wait a second, we've got we've got a whole bunch of Canadian forces, CF-18s in Aviano, Italy, on that same NATO mission. And we started the Kosovo mission on that day. And so it's always been like a period of, of, of service where um, you realize that you don't have much of a choice, that you that your role, your leadership, your contribution is so important that your decisions either keep on doing it or, or stop and get out of the way. Hmm. I've kind of described my career as being on a treadmill and somebody else is controlling the speed of the treadmill. And once in a while, they hit the incline button. Right. And so your choice is either you keep running or you get off the treadmill. But the other thing that I realized, and, and a great credit here to uh, Rick Hillier and, and Stu Beer, who were my neighbors in Petawawa back in 96, when we coined this phrase, decade of darkness, that uh, we who have served, who have broad operational experience, in my view, have a responsibility to provide strong, capable leadership, especially when times are tough. You know, leading an institution when times are good is easy. <laughs> when they're tough, then you've got to find it within yourself to be strong, to live values, and provide the guidance and leadership that people need to move forward. And so over all of these years and these experiences, that's what I kind of absorbed. And so for me, the choice of whether to stay with it or not, that kind of went away when I was a captain. Uh, when I was commanding the Royal Canadian Dragoons uh, and alongside the Brigade Commander Rick Hillier and and Stu Beer and other great leaders like Mike Jorgensen was there, Hillary Yeager was there, Kevin McLeod with uh, with two CER, Peter Devlin uh, with one RCR, Tom Tarrant uh, there just before. Uh, but you realize that that you need strong, capable leaders, and to leave the institution is an easy decision. But again, with the spirit of service to a country that has been so generous to me and my family, the, the, a country that is, in my view, the best country in the world, with soldiers, sailors, airmen, and women who, in my view, because of who they are coming from the fabric of Canada, they are the best individuals in the world to take on this military career. Um, I felt I had a duty to serve. Uh, but I also knew that, you know, after 37 years, you only have so much steam and then it's time for somebody else. But it was a choice of mine to serve out of a sense of responsibility to Canada. How did the, the chief of defense job, chief of the defense staff job come into being? Because it's a different thing now. It's the first time. It's the only real job in the Canadian Armed Forces um, that has obviously those responsibilities. It has that interface uh, with the, the prime minister, the minister, the deputy minister. I mean, it is really one of one. Uh, so how did that job come into being for you? Um, I had been serving as the vice chief of defense uh, from 2006 to 2008. And it was a, a difficult period of time because starting the summer of 2006, is when it became readily apparent um, that the mission in Afghanistan had changed dramatically. 
from one that was a security stability operation into a combat mission. Certainly we knew that by Labor Day weekend 2006. And I was serving as the vice chief during that period of time um, and uh, for, for General Hillier. And at the end of that tenure in spring of 2008, um, the, uh, the minister of the day, uh, Peter McKay, uh, asked whether I would be interested or if I wanted to be the chief. And at the time, I, I, I said to him, I don't really want to be the chief. I've just watched how hard General Hillier has worked these past two years, and, and I'm not sure I'm up to that. Uh, but, uh, but he said, well, what would you say if the government asked you to be the chief? I said, sir, I'll always salute the flag and I'll serve. But there was a bit of a board, and, uh, and so... In the summer of 2008, um, I became the chief of defense uh, during this period of time where we had this um, combat mission in Afghanistan and concurrently we're preparing for uh, support to uh, the government of Canada and, and the province of uh, British Columbia with the 2010 Olympics. So operationally, it was a very busy time. What were the, the things that stand out in your mind as the as the challenges at that in that job, the the big challenges. In my view, it was first and foremost to support the troops who were in harm's way, and I say the harm's way because not only was it the, those troops who were in Afghanistan, but in all of those other missions that we had at the time, whether it be in the Middle East, whether it be. Uh, in Haiti, because we had the uh, the mission to Haiti after the earthquake, um, but also all of those who were on domestic operations each and every day. You know, uh, we have search and rescue um, teams, uh, crews who are uh, on operations like every day. And so, first and foremost, I wanted to make sure that those who were in harm's way, those who were in operational missions, had all the support that they need, had all the authorities they needed not only to achieve their mission, but to come home to their families safely. And that was number one for me. Uh, second <clears throat> was really important to communicate. Communicate to Canadians, to communicate uh, to government officials what was going on and how it was going and what the challenges were. I used to have a line, <clears throat> I adopted this line when I was serving in, in Iraq in 2004, I was in Iraq for a full year, and my line was, the further you are from the sound of the guns, the less you understand. Because when you're close to the guns, either incoming or outgoing, you feel the concussion, you, you feel the blast, you feel the dust, the noise, and you know what you need immediately. And then the further you are from that you know, terrible threat, uh, things become much more bureaucratic and pedantic for you. And so what I wanted to make sure of is that we as the Canadian Forces leadership uh, and all of those who would listen would understand what our soldiers, sailors, airmen and women and special forces troopers were enduring in order to serve our country. And so that was uh, another key aspect. And then the third would be supporting our families. Uh, again, members of the armed forces make an individual choice to join the military. Uh, over their time, um, their families grow, uh, and we need to support their families. When it's time to leave the military, it's a family decision. And I wanted to make sure that all of the families had all the support that the Canadian Armed Forces could provide under all of the circumstances, especially information. But if... Uh, if people, if their loved ones were serving in harm's way, that they had all the support that they could. And I wish I could have done more in that regard. So if I go back to what you just said about, um, you know, the further you are from the sound of the guns, yeah. how does, how do you take that reality and make it something that's compelling and resonates in a, in a town, a place like Ottawa, where it is quite, you know, it's a different environment. I mean, a number of people think it's uh, very much a sort of insular microcosm uh, from a number of other realities, whether it be the military, 
any issue in Canada. So, so how then, as the you know the senior leader of the Canadian military, do you take that philosophy of the further you are from the sound of the guns, and make it compelling and interesting uh, to those decision makers sure. that, that hold the purse or you know the policies? And again, within context, um, I was Vice Chief 06, 2006, 2008, and Chief of Defence Staff from 2008 to 2012. During that period of time, what was so important was to get senior government leaders, senior military leaders, senior public servants into Afghanistan, into Haiti, into the preparations for the Olympics so that they could see firsthand what was going on. And not only on a one-off visit, but as frequently as they could sustain given their own operational or their own responsibilities. And so that was one aspect that was absolutely key because, again, it is one thing to receive a briefing in a very sterile office environment in Ottawa about the situation and what's going on. It's quite another thing to be in Afghanistan, in Kandahar, at a forward operating base, and to be receiving a brief in the heat, in the dust, in the, with the blast of the incoming, the outgoing or to see young soldiers, sailors, airmen and women, special forces, troopers with that thousand yard stare because they've just come out of combat. That's one thing. The second aspect that we did, and I would say this was a very positive experience when we realized that the environment had changed from a stability, almost a peacekeeping operation that we thought was occurring in Kandahar in 2005, six to a combat mission, and we realized how our vehicles were not up to the task, did not have the blast protection that they required. We received exceptional support from the scientific technical group, um, the Assistant Deputy Minister of Science and Technology, because we did destructive blast testing in Valcarce with the, the classic um, um, crash test dummies inside vehicles, and we filmed everything. We said, okay, if you put an improvised explosive device like we are facing in Afghanistan in this proximity to one of our vehicles, here's what it looks like. And we filmed it. And in 2006, seven, as the vice chief with a team of these extraordinary people, I went around Ottawa with, here is the blast test dummy film. Like, here's what our soldiers are enduring. Mm -hmm. And the support we got from government was exceptional. And I tell you, it warmed my heart then just a few months later when here I am in Afghanistan and we have technicians who are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, uh, basically applying all of the reasonably uh, allocated funds to improve the armor protection of all of our vehicles to receive the Chinook helicopters and the Griffin helicopters, that, we, that those are very expensive. And from the moment that we receive them, and I think we received them like in, in uh, November, uh, I think it was 2009. I remember being there Christmas Day, was, uh, would have been 2009, for the first flight and the Chinooks uh, with, minister, with the defense minister. And within two, three months, our uh, Air Force leaders on the ground were organizing multinational complex air mobile operations, but bringing those helicopters in save lives. Mm -hmm. Save lives. The fact that our, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and women would not have to be transported on ground, save lives. So just to say that from visits in theater, getting the briefs on what the requirements were, but then walking around Ottawa with no kidding proof of the deficiencies of our equipment, we received hundreds of millions of dollars almost immediately and turned that around into improvements in the protection of our vehicles almost immediately and purchasing of additional vehicles from um, providers around the world 
in order to enhance our capability uh, in operations. How did your transition out of the military um, start? And again, this is you have one of one position. Does the CDS decide when the CDS is going to leave? I'm assuming the CDS gets to also <coughs> have, could be asked to leave as well. But you know, did you get to a point and say, I, I think I need to, to move on to the next thing? When I, thanks for the question, Chris, when I got into the role uh, and having served um, the time I had and seen the kind of lead, great leaders go through the uh, executive leadership suites, um, my going in uh, assumption, and I mentioned this to the prime minister at the time, that my going in assumption is I would do three years. Uh, so 2008 to tw uh, 2011, and that would be it. Um, the uh, I was asked by government to extend, and uh, given our operational missions, I said, okay, I'll extend. <laughs> but let me tell you, it, it's a tiring job. Uh, at one point in 2010, uh, or at the end of 2010, my staff came back to me and said, hey, sir, just want you to know that throughout 2010, in addition to your normal work, you attended 170 other functions and your wife attended 103 other functions. No, no wonder my, yeah. my energy level was kind of low and, and you're in perpetual jet lag because yeah, of I, I went into Afghanistan every, every quarter, every three months. I went back in Afghanistan because things changed. And when, you're, when you go into any theater, you, whatever you see has a lasting impression and you think that's the way it'll always be. And that's not the case. Things change, they evolve, and especially in Afghanistan, things change from winter to summer. You know, so there would be some times that I would, I still remember when the, the Canadian Forces Chief Warrant Officer Bob Clarou just took over from Greg Lacroix. Again, two exceptional leaders, but, but uh, Chief Petty Officer Bob Clarou came in, just an amazing guy. And, and I said, uh, you know, Bob, congratulations, you, you're, you're in this great job, but we're about to go around the world. <laughs> and so it's like, what? Yeah, we're going to go visit the Navy <laughs> in Hawaii on the rim of the Pacific exercise. So we're going to be a, uh, aboard our ships. Uh, and, and then we're going to go to Singapore for a conference. And then we're going to go to Afghanistan. And then we're going to go visit more ships in the Middle East. And then we're going to go to a NATO meeting in Brussels. Uh, and then we're going to probably stop and see the Air Force in Iceland. And then we're going to come home. <laughs> it's, it's like, what? Because we have people all over the world. And no, member, no matter where our folks were, they always believed that the folks back home forgot they were there. Yeah, it's, 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 which is not, not hard to get yourself into that mindset. No, and just as an aside, here it is again, Christmas in Afghanistan. Uh, this is um, December 25th, 2009 at about 11 o'clock at night, and on top of, the, of a leopard tank, a leopard two tank is sitting on top of a mountain overlooking this forward operating base called Masamgar. And a sergeant is on duty at this time of night because all of the junior ranks were allowed to be down in the mess tent where there we've brought in exceptional, talented musicians and, and comedians to entertain them. So the senior NCOs are on duty. And this sergeant in the Lord Strathcona horse, Royal Canadians, he's on duty. And, and beside uh, me standing on this deck is the Minister of Defence, Peter McKay. <laughs> and and uh, Laurie Hahn, who's a member of Parliament at the time out of uh, Edmonton. And I believe the Secretary of State for Sport, uh, Mr. Lunn from Victoria. And we're giving this sergeant Olymp Olympic mittens for the upcoming 2010 Olympic Games in Vancouver. And the sergeant turns to us and says, hey, sir, does anyone in Canada know that I'm here? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I said, sergeant, God bless you. God bless you. But the fact that you've got the minister here and this whole entourage, our message to you is Canada knows that you're here and we appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I stayed on for four years and I had a policy at the time that 
uh, retirement was 35 years of service, 55 years of age, whatever comes later. And I wanted to walk my talk on that. And to walk my talk, I retired on my 55th birthday, <laughs> 37 years of service on the 29th of October, you know, uh, 2012. And uh, but also I knew that I'd done as much as I could. And you need fresh ideas. You need new energy to roll in and, you know, continue to inspire the folks. And um, and I had had a number of offers um to, you know, public speaking and to do other things. But I said to government that what I really would like to do is to work at Veterans Affairs because I was worried, especially with all of those who were wounded from operations um, in Afghanistan on other operations here at home, I was really worried about the support they would receive. And so um, I was surprised that a few months later, they asked me to become president of the space agency. (laughs) And again, earlier in our conversation, I can tell you, well, I I mentioned to you that my my academic marks in like (laughs) mathematics, chemistry and physics were somewhat lacking. Uh, You know, my degree scroll says I have a bachelor in business administration, but in reality, I thought it was a a, um, a bachelor in rugby and football. And so uh, I was blessed to have this exposure to the most talented engineers and scientists in the Canadian Space Agency uh, who were pursuing extraordinary uh, space missions like continued support the International Space Station, uh, the radar uh, constellation, uh, radar sat constellation mission, um, support to James Webb Telescope. Uh, Osiris Rex and and other great missions. Uh, But after 15 months in that role, I was so thrilled that uh, government gave me the opportunity to serve as Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs. And and I was in that job for about seven years. And what I try to do was, in the same way that in the armed forces, I tried to instill a culture of, of operational priority of supporting those those folks in harm's way at Veterans Affairs, I tried to instill uh, a culture of what I coined as care, compassion, and respect. That the mission of that department, and and again, this is really the ministers in each case uh, endorsed, supported, uh, uh, walked walked this path. But the notion that the department's role is to care for every one of those. Uh, folks who had served in the armed forces as if they were family, as if they were your parents, your siblings, uh, your closest friends, but it, sincere care for, and from the heart. Uh, the notion of compassion is the idea of if you have to default in your decision making, default to compassion. And the third was respect, that whether it be a wounded uh, serving member, uh, a meddled veteran, or a grieving family member, provide respect no matter what. And sometimes when folks are having a tough time, they say what they say. Mm -hmm. And you respect that. And don't push back on that. So the whole cultural change to care, compassion, and respect. And I was so thrilled to see the impact on the department the legislation that Canada have for, for veterans is unique in the world because the legislation indicates that the veteran uh, in any uh, kind of decision is to be given, quote, the benefit of the doubt in favor of the veteran. So with that notion of care, compassion and respect, we were able to operationalize what was in legislation, what was law. Mm. And so just thrilled to see and, and also, uh, again, uh, credit to the government over this past while providing additional funding. When I got into the job in 2014, there was no notion that we would receive additional funding for veterans. Over my experience with the department, the veteran file received in excess of $11 billion of new funding for well-being, for treatment, for families, for rehabilitation, for uh, education, and so on. So it was really terrific. 
So what you just outlined, I mean, I think is very similar to your philosophy um, that you, you led throughout with the, in the Canadian Armed Forces. What did you learn uh, or that you didn't know when you went into that job? Because you obviously have been exposed to veterans in uniform, but now you're the deputy minister. What did you learn about, you know, the about veterans? What did you learn about sort of care uh, in that in that role that you were maybe not aware of beforehand? It's interesting uh, that a number of veterans have come up to me over this past few years and come up. Some of them have said, hey, sir, like, I'm really sorry about the hard time I gave you early on in your job. I said, what do you mean? So, oh, you know, just after my injury, after whatever, I was having a tough time. And receiving the supports of Veterans Affairs Canada, receiving the support from family, from from community, from other veterans, given all the tools, the individual is able to take ownership of their own situation. And this is key. Like, and, and Veterans Affairs, in my view, have done a pretty good job of laying out uh, what creates the well-being of a veteran. Like, why do some folks transition well and why others don't? And they came up with seven, they call it seven domains of well-being. So when someone releases from the armed forces, it's, it's really tough and traumatic because these are, you know, you're serving with those who are so close to you. You have shared experience, shared adversity, great trust. And for whatever reason, you leave that fraternity of trusted uh, friends and colleagues and you're on your own. And so what allows folks to transition well, and, and, and Veterans Affairs are broken down into these seven domains, the first one being having a sense of purpose. And, and this is known, I mean, I'm, <laughs> this is well known, but to have it stated that for once you leave the armed forces, no one's telling you what your purpose is every day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it be your NCOs or your, your team. Uh, so once you leave, you need to know what are you going to do? And, and like every day is Saturday kind of wears thin very quickly. Mm -hmm. So what's your purpose? The second is financial security. To make sure that you have enough um, so you live a stable life. Uh, the third, and, and it's different from the previous two, is, is a roof over your head. Have proper shelter. The next one is having proper medical care. Uh, family support, community support. And the last one is identity. Identity. That for your entire time in uniform, your identity was established by that uniform and the fraternity of folks that you were with. And people define themselves by that identity. The moment they leave the armed forces... It's like their identity has vanished. And that's why the participating in associations, whether it be the Royal Canadian Legion, the Army, Navy, Air Force vets, the NATO vets, the United uh, Peacekeeping veterans, Afghanistan veterans, whatever association, I would urge folks to figure out what their identity is because it actually keeps them well as do the other six domains. I mean, having a purpose every day, you know, ensuring you have financial security and, and so all of those others. But this final one's important because uh, to realize who you are and to be proud of that and to ensure that it makes you happy. So that's the one thing I kind of took away is this understanding that with these domains of well-being, that if you have that surrounding a veteran, then the veteran may be able to take ownership of their situation and move forward. Some of those veterans who came up and apologized thought that everyone would do all of these things for them. In the same way that we kind of do a lot of this in the military for uh, struggling soldier, sailors, airmen, and women. The, the supports are there. The NCO and officer leadership is there to support those who are struggling. But in civilian life, it's not there unless you seek it out. 
uh, and then or indicate that you need help. And so if you get the support, then you enable the individual to take ownership and seek a different kind of independence going forward. But one of the difficulties that we have when you release from the armed forces is you think that folks all with all that support can get you back to where you were when you were a teenager and in your 20s when you joined the armed forces and you were physically fit and capable, your wits about you. And the, realize, and, and the reality is that after decades of service, things have changed. Not only are you a little older and hopefully more mature, um, but all of these experiences have had an impact on you. And so you are a different person. And everybody's service in the armed forces, no matter whether they served in the same units and same ranks, all that experience was unique to the individual. You started off the career in the armed forces as a unique individual. You had unique uh, experiences. You are a different person when you leave. And so the supports are different to enable that well-being going forward. Hey, Walt, this has been awesome. I'm uh, just going to ask you the last question that I, I ask all, uh, all the guests. Uh, do you have any recommendations for a listener that uh, is going to educate, uh, entertain, or potentially elevate a cause? I would just say to everybody, volunteer. Volunteer in whatever cause is important to you. Uh, volunteer in your community. Uh, be that helping hand uh, immediately. And not only will you make a difference in a contribution, uh, but your own well-being will be enhanced by that experience. So I would just say to everybody, please volunteer. Make your community better. Make Canada better. Wonderful. This has been a real pleasure. I appreciate your time and the, the opportunity to get to, to know you better and spend some time with you has really been uh, fantastic. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for the interest and support. You can find information in the show notes on the deportation of the Polish people to Siberia, Canada's old permanent military presence in Germany, Walt's time as Chief of the Defence Staff, Veterans Affairs Canada, and, as recommended by Walt, ways you can get more involved as a volunteer in your community and country. Thanks for listening to the NSP, and goodbye until next time.